Hey, take it, Agnes. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Very happy to see you here for our uh, February seminar where we have Kalle Rokolainen um, give a presentation on Amazonian Malastomataceae. So we are actually going to a new biogeographic area. I don't think we've spent much time in our previous seminars on the Amazon. And a few words about Kalle. I, asked him about himself and actually when he what he sent me made me smile a lot because it reminds me a lot of a European view of the world as a student. So Kala became fascinated with Amazonian rainforests when he started studying biology at the University of Helsinki in Finland and he knew the local Finnish forests pretty well and the um, vegetation, the plants sort of indicator species that you would find in different uh, forest habitats. Um, and well, he wanted to contribute to protecting the Amazonian rainforest. And when he finally, for the first time arrived in the Amazon, he realized that we basically know nothing about Amazonian rainforest, let alone that we would know uh, indicator species there or species that would make us recognize certain habitat types and hence um, species that probably could be useful to use um, as indicators for which areas to protect and which um, areas would be most threatened. Um, so this was a large motivation for Kala to um, go deeper into his Amazonian research. And then, as we all know, melastomes are very easy to recognize in the field, like at least the family you will know very easily. And then also they're not super tall compared to other lowland rainforest trees. Many, uh, many are, or most, almost all are terrestrial. Um, shrubs, trees, lianas sometimes. And there are many, but they're not hopelessly many. So they're actually, it's a number that you could probably still manage in the Amazon. And uh, Kalle continued to doing his PhD in Finland in 1990, um, starting in 1990 at the uh, University of Turku. And he by now is involved into a big research team at the University of Turku um, that is uh, investigating the Amazon, Amazonian biogeography and ecology. And uh, yeah, well, I guess he'll he'll be forging ahead towards directions of um, well, community ecology, but also um, more including soil um, aspects that structure uh, plant distribution and geology. And well, I'm very excited to hear what Kala has to say today. And I guess the floor is yours. And please share the screen. We are all very excited for your talk. Thanks. Thanks. I'll I'll start there. The uh, screen sharing now. Let's see how it goes. So I I hope you are. Oops, this is actually looks good. Yep, this should be the title. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm happy that I was invited for this talk. I have been very. Uh, interested in, in hearing other talks and I, now I'm, I'm really proud that I can give my contribution to this series. I hope that you can, you can enjoy. It's a bit different topic from the taxonomic, taxonomically oriented previous ones, but uh, I have tried to make this as easy as possible for, for, for you to follow, even if you are not so familiar with, with ecological things that I'm I'm mostly talking about. So this is a, a, a paper or a study that is, um, oops, how is, why is it, ah, there, okay. A, a study which is uh, basic or it's based on, on a chapter in the, in the book that uh, Renato, Frank and, and Fabian has edited and supposedly coming out soon. And we are uh, actually free authors as you saw in the, in the previous, um, previous slides. And uh, let's go to, to the background of this study. So the, the soil gradient that I'm, I'm uh, talking about a lot in this talk 
is a gradient of uh, soil base cation concentration, calcium, uh, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. And uh, this is a, 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 a feature, a characteristics of soil that quite often has been found to be correlated with uh, soil fertility, how productive a soil is. Um, I'm, mm, I'm, I don't really like to use the soil fertility, at least not in this talk, because it's a bit vague um, concept. So I, I try to just talk about uh, uh, base cation concentration or soil cations. Um, but you can kind of think it as a, as a proxy for soil fertility. And now this, um, via several studies, uh, I can say that this uh, base cation concentration is actually something that has been found to be uh, very relevant for Amazonian flora. Um, uh, it's uh, related to changes in, in species composition uh, in many plant groups, like in, in this figure, I'm trying to kind of illustrate it. These are uh, ordinations. So, so in every uh, box, there are symbols and the size of the symbol indicates the uh, level of uh, cation concentration, meaning that the high or, or the larger is the symbol, the bigger is the, the base cation concentration. Uh, and the, um, the, each symbol actually also indicates a, a site, a geographical locality, in this case in, in middle Jurua region in Brazil. Um, the, Melastomatase row is here, uh, second from the top. And uh, whenever there are two symbols which are close to each other, it means that they are very similar to each other in species composition. In species composition of melastomes or uh, ferns in the top row, or below melastomes, palms, and then gingers in the lowermost row. And, and this uh, to the left, the left column is just based on, on species composition, presence or absence of species, and the, the right column is, is species abundance. But anyway, the kind of take home message in all of these frames is that uh, those symbols that are close to each other, meaning that they are floristically similar, also have rather similar size of the symbol. There's a, there are squares and triangles and circles, and those refer to geological uh, interpretation of the site, uh, which is actually not an issue in now. So it's just the size and position of those symbols that is uh, worth to look at here. Okay, so base cation concentration indicated as the size of the symbol is quite obviously related to the species composition in various plant groups in Amazon. And it's, it's also the local abundance uh, that can be related to, to base cations. Uh, this is an example of a rather old study that uh, Han and I and, and several others, we did it in, in Yasuni in Ecuador. Uh, to the left, there are fern species. To the right, there are melastome species. Each column indicates the number of individuals that we encountered in a certain site in the forest. And then the sites or the columns, they are organized or put in order according to increasing concentration of base cations. So, for example, here, this Clinemia dimorphica, or actually it's Meconia nowadays, but anyway, this species here uh, is uh, more abundant in the lower end 
of the uh, gradient and then there are some in the higher end and then on the other hand there's a, this uh, species here actually it's Miconia palaeacea I know now a bit better uh, which is really preferring the, the uh, highest concentration of uh, cations uh, and um, because there is this relationship between species composition and soil base cations, they can actually also be um, connected in such a way that if you know the species composition uh, in certain locality and you know the preferences of the species, then you can actually predict what is the cation concentration of that site where the soil has not been actually measured or investigated in that. And, and this is a study that uh, about 10 years ago we published together with Lasse Suominen and, and some other people, which just indicates on the, on the X axis here, there is the measured uh, cation concentration indicated in, in logarithmic scale. And in the Y axis, we have the predicted uh, logarithmic cation concentration. And, and these are now the, the predictions, each point there uh, gives a, a locality where we know the measured and we know the predicted by a certain method that is not so important here. Uh, but anyway, the important message is that it really works. You can predict the soil-based cation concentration on the basis of melastone species composition in Amazonian rain. Okay, uh, in this study, uh, I'm mostly talking about niches and, and niche of course is a basic concept in ecology. Um, this is just taken from a textbook where there are two species, um, one which is indicated or two uh, niches of, of species, uh, one species, indicated with red color, has a wider niche. It's a generalist and the, the other one is a specialist species along this undefined environmental axis. And uh, both have the same optimum value along the, the axis. And the, the niche width can be said to be wider for the generalist and, and narrower for the specialist. And uh, in this case, they are defined so the niche width is defined so that it's just the width uh, at the level where the um, abundance is uh, reaching about 1.6 times the optimal abundance. And this is actually, I just gave this 0.6 here because it's a it's a method that we opted to use in in our study as well i mean it's totally arbitrary but uh, it's a choice that has been made before and that's why why we uh, took that about the niches um, you can also think that if there are two species along the same uh, resource axis there may exist some competition and then then the 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 niche uh, form, which is usually drawn as a more or less bell-sized or bell-shaped uh, curve, symmetrical one. It's not necessarily symmetrical in reality. Actually, quite often you can expect that it, it's uh, it's uh, skewed because people, uh, uh, not people, but uh, species interact. Uh, with each other and, and then a superior uh, competitor may kind of push the other weaker one away a little bit and then it may result in in this case, case positive skew in the in the uh, response shape. So optimum needs width and response shape are, are things kind of basic things in the in the uh, niche that you can you can talk about okay uh, 
what we know about uh, or can kind of guess about uh, melastomes specifically is that uh, if we look at melastomes, we have seen in, in previous studies that, uh, uh, I mean, here are two figures. The left one is uh, for ferns and the right one is for all melastomes. And each dot or, or its symbol there means a site, a locality where the number of species has been recorded in a, in a kind of equal sized uh, area. And uh, looking at this uh, melastome site, we can see that uh, um, along the x axis, which is again soil based cation concentration axis in logarithmic scale. Along the, the, the cation axis, um, number of melastome species per locality seems to be a little bit higher towards the lower end. I mean, not it's it's kind of the optimum is somewhere in the lower end, not the, at the very extreme low, but but anyway, somewhere there. And it, especially, it's a bit kind of. Uh, pointing to the lower uh, concentration than what we can observe with ferns that seem to be higher in richness in the, in the higher end. So what we can kind of expect to see is that melastome, if we look at melastome species niches at their optima, we would kind of expect that the, the optima are concentrated in the lower end. But that actually has been directly not been measured uh, previous studies again have shown that uh, uh, a, a kind of expectation about niches is that uh, larger organisms or larger species, bigger, or in this case, it's a comparison between understory and uh, canopy palms in Amazonia. Uh, so larger species might have wider niches. At least this is what has been observed for palms. And it has been kind of suggested for a comparison between trees and, and herbs or shrubs as well. But the actual demonstration of this kind of relationship is, is not generally kind of done. And for melastomes, it has definitely not been studied. Uh, about the, the, the melastomes, one aspect, as, as Agnes already told us, and, and we all, all, of course, know, they are self supporting melastomes and climbers. And uh, um, we could kind of expect that, uh, uh, or at least say that uh, uh, the niche width is not necessarily uh, on average equal between self-supporting and climbing uh, species, plant species, because we already know that in addition to having different life forms, uh, they have also different ecology, at least in the sense that, that uh, lianas or climbing uh, plants seem to cope better with, uh, with deficiency of water. Uh, OK. Um, finally, one or I think this is the final th uh, thing in the background about the niches uh, is that uh, if we think about species abundance and uh, distribution, or let's say frequency in the landscape, uh, there is a demonstrably a, a correlation so that uh, those species, at least among trees, that are locally frequent and abundant, uh, or frequent are also abundant. So, so this has led to an assumption uh, which has actually not been really tested, but an assumption that perhaps the reason or one of the reasons why some species seem to be dominant in, in landscapes 
is that they also have wider niches so that they are more generalists in their ecological requirements. Okay, uh, so this the aim of the, this study is then to, to kind of um, uh, wonder about the concept of niche among melastomataceae, uh, see how the niche width and optimum vary among a big uh, uh, number of melastomataceae species in Amazonia, and to put it more kind of in more precise terms, uh, there are six more exact questions uh, related to niche width and uh, optimum in melastomataceae especially. So what, what is actually the proportion of the species that really have a non-random response to this uh, soil cation gradient? Uh, is the, the niche width associated with abundance or growth form or height of the species? Uh, is the average niche widest where the optimum is uh, scarcest along the gradient? This was the, the competitive uh, interaction or, or relationship among species that among other things would give the prediction. Uh, what are the, uh, or are the optima of the species uh, uh, really concentrated to the lower end as we could kind of guess? And uh, can we then actually reliably estimate the niche width and optimum uh, for the species based on field data. I mean, if you measure something in one area and estimate that this happens, this species happens to be a specialist for a grid soil and has a wide or, or narrow niche, is that true also in an other geographic area? And all these actually, these aspects relate to the uh, uh, let's say indicator value of the species. So, so are there actually some melastome species that seem to be particularly fit or suitable uh, to serve as indicators of uh, a certain uh, uh, cation concentration in the soil? Uh, the analyses are are based on a, on a database in which uh, there are 284 inventory lines in Amazonian rainforests, each line five meter wide and 500 meters long. Uh, and all the individuals of all the species of melastomes have been counted along those lines. Um, the, the lines as here you can see the, the, the geographical distribution of them. So they are kind of concentrated according to the excursions that we have done. Uh, and in every line we collected uh, soil samples and uh, measured in the laboratory uh, via standard methods the, the concentration of those uh, concentrations of those base cations. And to the right in this, this uh, figure, you can see how the two regions present, represented with, with the red and, and blue color, how they kind of differ from each other. Both have the same number of, of transect lines and uh, kind of roughly the same, represent the same uh, gradient length along the, the, the cation gradient. Uh, so just some features, general features of the data. Uh, there were 246 taxa or species, 150 name, 152 named and uh, 40 or so more without uh, scientific name, just morphospecies. species. More than 7,000 individuals altogether and uh, median number of taxa or species per line 
was 23 and the number of individuals almost 200. And uh, in this study, what, what we have done is that we have made kind of estimation, estimates of the response of the species along the uh, cation gradient. Um, we did the estimation for 205 species that had uh, frequencies or frequency over uh, five or frequency six or, or higher, because if the frequency is very low, then obviously it's not really worth even trying any, any model of response. And uh, the, the Hof or who is Heisman all fresco model or Hof model means that uh, there are different types. In this case, actually five types. The first type is just that there is no, no uh, non-random response at all. Uh, but those that are, are non-random responses are four different types, type two, three, four, and, and five. The first to the left is uh, just monotonic response so that uh, it monotonically either decreases or increases along the gradient. The second one is, is a step or type three is the step function so that there's a level first and then it drops fairly quickly to zero or practically zero or vice versa. It can start from zero and, and, and rapidly grow and then continue at the, at the same level. The type four is the, is the classical uh, unimodal, symmetrical unimodal response. And the type five is, is unimodal but skewed response. Here are four examples of species that have had the, the response and the, the, bright, uh, the, the bright red line is, is the curve that is fit there. And which response to, to kind of choose from the, from the options is defined by the principle of parsimony. So basically uh, the kind of easiest way to, to explain is chosen whenever it's possible. Um, this was the, the result among the, the 205 species, 204, so all except one had non-random uh, response, so basically all. And most, of, most often they had uh, uh, unimodal, quite often uh, this step response. And in only a few cases, the uh, monotonic response. Most often it was a unimodal skewed response. Uh, this is a, a random selection of 50 species out of those 200 or so, but it shows the, the position of the optimum and the width uh, of the niche along the, the um, soil cation uh, gradient. And what we can see from this is that, yes, indeed, most melastomes in Amazonia, at least in this data set, seem to really prefer the relatively poor end of the, of the gradient. So in that sense, it was kind of rather expected result. Um, about the skewness of the response, um, there was some um, or, or kind of little bit uh, non-randomness among all the all the species that had unimodal uh, skewed response in the sense that uh, uh, when the optimum of the species was in the lower median, then a little bit more than what we expected or could have expected had positively skewed response, meaning that there's a long tail towards the right or towards the, the higher end. And uh, 
at least we think that this is just an indication of the of the kind of quality or or let's say a length of the uh, gradient in the sense that if if we don't really have the full gradient that exists then uh, it's kind of truncated in both ends and therefore many species actually uh, superficially or they look like having positively skewed response even though it might be symmetrical so there's a at least our interpretation is that there's a slight effect of this kind of truncation of the gradient but anyway uh, the length of the gradient that, that we measured uh, it was about or it was surely about as long as uh, any other studies of, of Amazonian soils have reported. So, so, but well, anyway, we didn't have actually white sand uh, forests or not many white sand forest uh, sites. I think there were four or five or so out of the 280 transects. So, so probably at least at the lower end, something was missing. Uh, okay, um, in this one, uh, we have regressions of the, the uh, optimum uh, of uh, melastone species along the cation axis uh, against uh, different explanatory uh, variables. And uh, Actually, you don't need to look at so much of the of the uh, numbers there. As soon as you realize this column R square here, which means that how kind of uh, uh, how much each of these regression explains, and you can see that none of the regressions really explain anything uh, relevant or at least not anything biologically relevant, even though statistically perhaps there are some that, that might be. But anyway, so the frequency of the species doesn't explain anything about the, the, the position of the optimum, neither the number of individuals or average number of individuals per site where it occurs, or plant height, or or uh, uh, height of the of the self-supporting plants or or vines. Um, okay, these are perhaps not so. Let's say um, surprising, but then about the niche width, there were several reasons to expect that uh, similar kind of regression regressions might give us uh, some results that that really are worth looking at biologically but again if we look at the r square okay there's one which is frequency meaning that the more frequent species have uh, wider niches and this was actually something that that we could kind of expect and it's related to the expectation of this oligarchy hypothesis, the hypothesis that uh, generalist species have wider niches. But it's it's uh, the the kind of predictive value is is very low indeed. And and if we think about the, the oligarchy hypothesis, that that is specifically about the dominance. I would say that the average number of individuals per site, meaning that uh, a species that is very abundant in any locality where it occurs, I think that is the fairest way to indicate dominance. And uh, according to this measure, the more dominant species are, are not at all kind of uh, having wider niches than those that are uh, 
this domain. So uh, if that is a deception or disappointment, I don't know, but anyway, this was the result. Uh, then about the, the, the comparison between the, the, the two areas, the Western or Northwestern uh, Amazonia and uh, uh, Western plus uh, or Southwestern plus Central Amazonia. Uh, if we look at the, the type of response, uh, there was uh, some consistency. I mean, if a species was uh, modeled as having the type three response, then it should have had type three response in Northwestern Amazonia as well. In this case, actually it didn't fulfill well at all. Uh, so kind of along this diagonal, you should kind of encounter the concentration of the species. Mm, for the type five response, yes, it's true. And of course you can also say that if the model uh, was saying that it's a uh, uh, unimodal, then it was usually unimodal in one. If the model was saying that it's unimodal in one area, then it was unimodal in the, in the other area as well. So to that degree, it's fine. But then kind of further details are not necessarily so, so reliable. So this kind of take home message from this is that uh, the response shape is not necessarily very accurately estimated for individual species in, in this, uh, at least in this, this data set. Uh, this is then about the, the optimum uh, uh, the consistency in the optimum, uh, which is measured in such a way that in the y-axis, we have the difference in the estimated optimum between Northwest and Southwest Central uh, Amazonia. So for example, if we take this circle here, it's one species, that was occurring in both geographical areas. In both geographical areas, it had frequency at least six, and therefore it was modeled with the, with the Hof model. And uh, it gave us practically the same niche position, the same optimum. So it was very kind of, uh, well done model in one area because it was giving uh, the same model in the in the other area in terms of the position of the optimum. Whereas this particular species here uh, gave us a, a, a much uh, higher position of the optimum in the in the northwestern Amazonia than in the southwestern Amazonia. The, the scale here is the logarithmic scale, 10 base logarithmic scale. The whole gradient length was about 2.5 units in this logarithmic scale. Okay, so in this area, we can see that there is quite a lot of uh, variation. They are not at all uh, falling close to the zero, which was the, the kind of ideal case or which would have been the ideal case. But then in the y, in the x axis is the minimum frequency in either Northwestern or Southwestern Central Amazonia. So that uh, here, uh, here we have a species that has a, a uh, minimum frequency about 25 or so, either in Northwestern or Southwest Central Amazonia. Uh, 
And here we have a species that has a minimum frequency about 30 or so in one or the other of the, of the uh, regions. And what we can see is that as soon as the minimum frequency gets to 20 or, or more, then suddenly the estimated position of the optimum becomes actually fairly good. We are staying not exactly in the, in the, in the zero difference, but anyway, not so far from that either. Uh, the total abundance is given by, by colors and uh, the size of the, the, um, of the uh, symbol gives the optimum in Northwestern region. So the, the bigger is the symbol, the, the higher optimum that species has in Northwest. Okay, uh, what we can conclude about this is that, uh, well, first of all, practically all species do have non-random uh, distribution along the cation gradient. Uh, and practically uh, no external feature of the species predicts its breadth or the width of the species, uh, width of the niche. Uh, and uh, what we can kind of conclude from this combination is that, okay, if we want to uh, choose or in, uh, find indicator species, then uh, practically any species will do, uh, except that uh, uh, if we remember the, the, the last result that I presented that the uh, frequency around 20 or so, minimum frequency uh, around 20, will give us kind of uh, reliable estimate of the, of the optimum. Then we can say that, that for this reason, abundant or, or frequent species would be preferred. And then of course, also in terms of uh, practicality, it's better to use uh, abundant or common species because you simply find them more easier than, than rare ones. So in practical terms, then those would be kind of preferred. But there is no, no kind of, uh, these are all just practical reasons. There is no biological uh, reason why one melastom species should serve better as an indicated species than another. Um, the, uh, probably the, the, the kind of, at least for me, the, the interesting uh, uh, kind of second most interesting thing was that the, really the abundance or dominance of melastomataceae or the species of, of melastomataceae is uh, not giving any real indication of niche width. So at least if, if we look at the uh, base cations, then the prediction of the, of the oligarchy theory doesn't really get fulfilled. And uh, at least to my or to our knowledge, this is this is the first um, kind of test of the ecological premise of the of the uh, uh, of the um, theory or or concept, and it doesn't actually pass the test. So so I don't know what to think about the uh, oligarchy theory in general then. Uh, finally, I would like to give some ideas or thoughts about, uh, about the future. Uh, now, at the, ah, sorry, in the, in here, actually, I, I want to just point out that in the, in the book chapter, 
this is just an advertisement. Uh, in the book chapter, there's a, a compilation of 81 species uh, that are frequent. And therefore, we believe that the, the niche uh, width and position are, are kind of better uh, estimated than, than for other species that are frequent and also have, have been identified to the scientific name. And for those species, we in the book, we give a, uh, an appendix where those species are listed and their niche characteristics are, are also given to be used by, by anyone interested about, about these issues. Oops, out of direction. So then about the future. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have about 70 inventory lines. So in this, this particular uh, study, we used uh, a bit less than half of those. Those were the lines where species abundances have been recorded and also where the, the identification or the cross-checking of the specimens has been, has been done uh, at sufficient level. So it's a, it's a big data set, uh, but it's not publicly open at least not yet. So obviously it would be kind of, at least in my opinion, it would be ideal if the, the, the data set would become available in, in for science in general. And uh, ideally uh, also it should not be a data set that is just kind of uh, existing as a flat data set, but because all the collections that we have made in the field uh, are referred to a kind of internal type specimen, meaning that whenever I have recorded an individual, I have a, a, a specimen to which I can refer that this, uh, this um, particular individual represents. Um, I, I've certainly not collected every individual, but I've collected per every excursion uh, a kind of type specimen that uh, serves as a, as a reference. So uh, what I see with this uh, data set is that there's an actually, or there should be a possibility to make it a, a data set that uh, would be able to grow so that anyone interested would be able to put his or her own inventory uh, to the existing ones and do the cross-checking. And uh, that cross-checking, obviously, I mean, you can do it if you come to Turku, but uh, uh, with your specimens, but that's that's rather cumbersome. So, so I think that uh, just high quality digital photographs might do the trick. Or if not that, then at least the uh, DNA techniques. But but before going to that, I actually want to kind of uh, mention this that uh, the. Uh, if this kind of database really would, or if people would see it worth putting their data, then I would think that uh, it should be uh, based on the same principle as three data sets are nowadays, like the Rainfor or ATDN, that uh, if you put your, your three plot data there, then you remain the owner and uh, anyone wanting to use the data uh needs to have your your permission or basically ask your ask you as a co-author for for any study that use the data and that is of course an issue that you know, i don't know how how it will turn out but um, for field studies i think this is actually necessary if we want to have field inventory data sets increasing in the future. Okay, but then uh, 
this uh, identification based on on photographs or or actual specimens um, that certainly functions but then of course nowadays or in the future especially identifications hopefully can be done on the basis of of dna and uh, now here uh, if we think about the, the current situation where this eDNA or environmental DNA, the use of that has become more and more popular where you collect soil or, or air or, or feces or whatever bulk material and then check if you find a fingerprint of, of certain species. That is something where I think we should aim to go even in the tropics and even in, in Amazonia. But of course, it's not really possible because the, uh, there are simply no libraries for, for Amazonian trees, for example. But now again, the convenient size of, of Melastomataceae flora in Amazonia might actually give us a solution. And also the thing that uh, as we just saw uh, practically any uh, melastome species uh, can serve as an indicator of uh, at least of uh, soil based cation concentration. So basically, it means that uh, uh, by building a library for melastomataceae and then looking in this eDNA samples, just those melastomataceae species, it would be a, uh, possible to, to uh, establish uh, species compositional differences and similarities among localities and then use that for land use planning and conservation planning and so on. And uh, just the final figure, this is a, a study to uh, three years ago published study where which presents the Amazonian rainforest area via Landsat uh, in satellite images. And all the colors that you can see in this product, uh, they indicate something, something similar, something different in the surface. And our study, studies have shown that the species composition is, is actually quite closely linked with these, uh, uh, these color patterns. So when we see, for example, in these white sand areas of uh, Rio Negro region, uh, they have this bluish color. Uh, and uh, that really means that uh, uh, in floristic terms, these are kind of internally more homogeneous than, than uh, what, or, or let's say within that area, you find rather similar, floristically similar areas. At least they are among each other similar, uh, more similar than, than places that uh, uh, compare to the, to the Solimoas region or what you see here, so greenish color. So the, the, the colors indicate the, the species composition at least to some degree. Of course, there's also climate, uh, biological things like, like the bamboo forests you can see in, in different color and so on. But anyway, uh, using satellite images and indicator species, uh, and perhaps in the future, uh, DNA, sampling in this eDNA manner. By using that, even in a huge and difficultly uh, accessible forest area like Amazonia, it would be possible to obtain data points that are enough to really establish both by, uh, biogeographical or phytogeographical patterns and, and use and, and uh, 
soil patterns and use those for land use planning and, and conservation. Okay, I think I'll I'll stop here and give time for questions and and comments. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was that was great. That was a very different view of uh, yeah, Melissa Madesi. Are there any questions? I have many. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, you go ahead. <laughs> Um, Kali, I, I mean, many things to, to think about, and maybe later I will write you separately. But uh, one of the things that I was thinking is, is among the species that that you see as one end of the spectrum or, or of cation content, or maybe with a, at one end of the spectrum of type of responses, do you see any trends in the sense of a phylogenetic trend? So like species in this tribe tend to be more um, like a richer or do you have any phylogenetic information, not just the species names, at least for those 81 that are widely distributed? Yeah, um, no, I don't have a phylogenetic signal as such, but if I think, uh, well, if I think for example, Adelobotris, which uh, probably can be considered as, as a monophyletic group, uh, then at least among that genus, there, there are all kinds of species. I mean, there are species that uh, prefer the, the very poor end and also the species, there are species that prefer the very uh, rich end. Um, okay, the former Tokoka, uh, uh, which is perhaps a little bit problematic, but, but at least kind of roughly, I guess you can, you can think it as a, as a mono phyletic group, uh, it's, uh, it's also a similar thing, uh, that there are rich and, and poor and things. Uh, no, actually in Tokoka, there are many that are rather white generalists, but, but anyway, I mean, you, you can also find poor and, and rich and there. So, uh, but then of course, when it goes to all what is Clidemia and, and Leandra and so on, or, or whatever, yeah, I at least I don't I don't see any any signal, but of course the basic knowledge of the phylogeny is so so wanting still that that's hard to say. But uh, if it goes to for the for ferns, then in 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 that plant group at least there are I mean there are again similar thing. There are some genera that are definitely kind of having various kinds of responses, but there are also many genera that indeed are almost exclusively either poor end or, or rich end of the, of the gradient. Um, I'll ask a quick question because before we are out of time, um, I found it really interesting that you found different response shapes of different species in regards to um, the optimum between sites. Do you think that, I mean, you explained that to a large extent this is due to some species not occurring very frequently or not being present in enough of the, of the plots, but then do you think that the community has an effect, like the co-occurring species? Have you looked at that at all, how co-occurrence affects predictability of optimum? No, yeah, I'm, I have not checked that, I mean, yes, it's a... Uh uh it's always possible that that is a kind of uh, uh that how what are the particular species that are in a in a particular site will affect the 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 kind of realized uh, niche of the species and that i actually i believe that that effect exists but i have not really checked how or if that exists a lot more to do. I mean, with, with the great, I, I really like the, the outlook that you gave at the end with the idea of expanding this. And I think this is a really important point that you made and something that we need <laughs> to move field data, uh, data ahead, which is so important to have in the first place. Yeah. Are there any other questions, Fabian? From a practical point of view, like when you're measuring the, these things, 
do you have like the soil measurements are for the entire trend 500 meter transect or do you have you do that in several spots or do it where the plants are because i can see in some places even within 500 meters yes a huge difference especially if you're near yes. where there's water or no water how, how does that work yes uh, well in the uh, the method that we have used in the field is such that uh, uh, we choose the locality to put the 500 meter long inventory line in such a way that uh, uh, we first look at the satellite image and choose an, uh, a locality that seems to be as homogeneous in the color as possible in order exactly in order to avoid this kind of very abrupt changes along the same same transect line and then the transect line that goes across the, the local topography and uh, in order to include at least little bit of the topographic effect of the topographical variation in 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 soil characteristics we always try to collect two soil samples or we, we we collect three soil samples along the line and we collect two soil samples in a kind of uh, local topographically high position and one in a, in a topographically low position. Ah, these are all terra firme uh, transects. They are, in these ones, there were no, no uh, inundated area. Uh, areas at all included. We have done some of, of inundate, in, some in, inundated areas, but not actually that many. So it's mostly terra firme. That may, maybe, you know, when you, if you start including the inundated areas, I suspect you will get a lot more specificity for some species because I, I seen that, that that's where most of the yes. I know that are very locally restricted tend to be from flooded forests, not from terra firme. In my, yeah. in my anecdotal experience, <clears throat> I don't know if that's right. You see that in ferns or not. Yeah, I, uh, we have, uh, we have, for example, done some lines in, in our Hales or, or the Mauritia uh, stands. And, uh, and they, for example, they are, they have pretty different species from, uh, 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 forest patches, or at least those relatively few forest patches that, that we have uh, done in um, in, in so-called Varsia or, or forests where where the, the the inundation is more more how to say not so permanent because the the, the our halas usually they they actually they, they can even collect uh, peat even thick layers of peat. So it's more like swamp and not, not perhaps uh, so much of, of inundated area. So in, in that sense, yes, at least. Um, I, I have one last question. <laughs> you, you, you take a very um, detailed approach to su studying soil composition. And I was wondering how, or what do you think, what you found could be, scaled up you know to like bigger modeling scales where you usually just work with soil layers that are have a resolution of like one kilometer whether that would be meaningful at all from from what you found now at these more fine grained uh, layers or whether that would target totally different questions probably well the the, the soil yeah well we have three soil samples Per line and and actually we we have divided the the the, the lines in in such a way that uh, the standard way is that they are 20 meter uh, oh sorry 50 meter no 25 meter uh, units uh, so there are 20 units per line mm -hmm. and uh, um, so we can we can actually if we won't we can we can go to much finer grain than this 500 meter uh, grain that that was used for example in this analysis mm -hmm. and uh, uh, some analyses actually have been done also in, in that way and uh, 
and yes, in 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 some cases, it it, it really gives better better results, especially if you want to uh, take the the topographical effect into account. Yeah, and that certainly is something that that affects. It's the the drain it's as such, but also um, if there are high hills or not necessarily that high, but if there are hills and and uh, stream bottoms. Uh, then there's there has been erosion and if there has been erosion then it's possible that the, the erosion kind of exposes uh, geological layers that represent quite different types of sediments in in different uh, relative altitudes along the, the transect line and and that is of course something that that kind of creates the the local variation mm -hmm. uh, if you then want to uh, kind of um, uh, make even coarser grain analyses, uh, that's also possible and, and it might be also useful in some cases. Uh, at least we have found out that uh, um, the kind of uh, general geological formation is quite often uh, rather informative okay interesting uh, so so that uh, kind of uh, even though there's local there are local differences then then it really matters at at what uh, uh, kind of geological settings at what uh, epoch of the of the geological history uh, mm -hmm. the sediments have been uh, deposited and and what has been the the kind of uh, uh, source area for the sediments. Mostly, well, if not all, almost all of the of the sediments in Amazonia are, are, are transported by rivers. So they are brought from the Andes mostly and, uh, and then deposited, pre-worked and uh, transported and, and deposited and Kind of pre-deposited often several times and and from the andes they can come from volcanoes or 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 in, in uh, kind of different mixtures having several origins and and so it's it's all actually quite quite interesting and, and that kind of geological uh, purely geological uh, interpretation is something that that works well in a in a course uh, Crane uh, settings than, than just this kind of mm -hmm. 500 meter resolution. I don't, I don't know if I've answered. Really yes, you question. did. You did. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have a question. Like, can I? Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, first, nice to meet you, Kale. Um, I'm a big fan of your work. I'm Eduardo. I'm a PhD student in Brazil. I'm currently studying specialization niche evolution, but in the Atlantic forest. And I have seen like specialization regarding soil on those plants as well. And of, co and of course, um, grained resolution as Agnes was talking about like faster layers. But I was wondering like among the plants that you have sampled, you have seen that there is no correlation between general, oh, a really poor correlation between generalization and dominance, right? But mm -hmm. have you seen yeah. um, some sort of association of generalization and geographic range, total geographic range of those species? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that analysis was actually not included in the, in the chapter and uh, um, well, the, 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 the basic result was that uh, there seemed to be no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no relation Neither. either, but uh, I, I'm kind of, it, uh, I, I think that it, it was a little bit difficult to do that analysis or kind of uh, rely on the analysis because the, the knowledge on the, on the true area of distribution or size of the of the uh, area the of distribution right. is is something that uh yeah okay not, not really well known 
and and therefore I, I was kind of hesitating in in really doing or or let's say publishing the the result because I I thought that well it's so easy to kind of uh, argument that uh, okay you didn't find anything just because of the quality of the or poor quality of the data okay yeah but uh, but yeah on the other hand I had a lot of species. I actually did the analysis in such a way that uh, I downloaded from the from GBIF uh, the species, the, the coordinates of the of the occurrences of the species, and then then just measured the, the kind of um, uh, most extreme points. So kind of measuring the, the the longest distance that you could find. But then then that analysis also was a bit difficult because some species went to Central America and and then yeah what what is actually then the the the, the area of distribution is it is it kind of reasonable to even speak about the size of the distribution area so these kind of thoughts were were just I found them so complicated that I decided okay not at least what is <laughs> this particular chapter of the book I'm not going to to include that but I did some exercises, yes, so, and and definitely I think that it's an interesting question. If just that if the if the data is good, then if you if you really think about the the way how to how to measure how to kind of define the, the area okay. of distribution. Okay, nice. And after this, since you didn't see a correlation um, between the soil generalization and geographic extent. Do you think there is another niche access, another resource or condition that could be as important as soil to the melastomes in general? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, focus on soil. So, from your field experience, what do you think is would be a good predictor for those my myconia or melastome assemblages? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in in this particular study. I was just looking at the, the cation concentration because earlier studies have kind of indicated that among the uh, soil features that has have been studied, it's it's one of the most important ones. Well, they are like nitrogen. Uh, I would be very surprised if nitrogen is not important, but it's very difficult to measure in a in a kind of reasonable way because uh, it's a volatile element and uh, then you would actually need to measure it either in the spot in the forest or then collect the, the soil sample and, and freeze it and then analyze it in, in the lab and, and this is just logistically yeah it's just too demanding mm -hmm. um, but then then I mean, climate is is an obvious thing that uh, certainly affects uh, amount of precipitation. At least if if it comes to rainforest uh, plants, I mean, uh, there's by definition there's quite a lot of water in rainforest, but uh, within Amazonia or within the, the concept of of Amazonian rainforest. There's actually quite a lot of variation in the duration of, of uh, dry season. Mm -hmm. Even so that at least in the south, uh, southwest corner, you could even say that uh, or argue that uh, mm, it would be better to call them uh, kind of seasonal or, right. or, or semi-seasonal forest or something like that, because such a huge percentage of trees drop their leaves in, in the dry season. Uh, and uh, I'm quite sure that that affects. I, I like uh, in the, in my experience, the, the uh, the foothills of the Andes, like, like the Yasuni area uh, in Ecuador, that's, that's an area where where there's a lot of species and, and it has generally rather high uh, cation concentration or rather 
fertile soils. Mm -hmm. uh, but if 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 I compare that to 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 the southeastern Peru or or Madre Dios uh, area, um, the soils are rather similar, or at least they have, they have high cation concentration. Oh, the volcanic effect is, is missing. But anyway, they have high concentration of cations. So in that sense, they are similar and actually they share quite of many species, but the climate is definitely much drier. And uh, I don't know if that is the reason, but at least what is the, the reality is that the number of uh, melastone species is much, much lower than, than in Yasomi area. Um, so I'm, I definitely think that that climate is important, but um, yeah, but it's not something that for your, for those. Yeah, not areas. I have not really studied that, but but it's something that that uh, okay. I'm, I'm very interested in in looking at. In, but thank you, thank you. you know, it's really enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, well, I think we, we've gone a little bit over time. It, it's great. Uh, that means that everybody... Oh, you have a question there, Lucas? Uh, somebody had a... No? Okay. So we've gone a little bit over time. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kale will make this available um, in the next couple of days on the website. And um, I'm sure that Kale will be happy to answer questions over email. Once I will have some... Um, more than questions, uh, thoughts. <laughs> we'll be talking yeah. soon. Thank you very, thank you very much, Kali. Thanks, thanks, thanks for your interest and questions.